You're watching Tag TV. Hello and welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan to remain in grey list of FATF till February 2020. Hundreds of terrorists waiting to infiltrate into Kashmir from Jash training camps. Pakistani terrorists target police vehicle in Quetta city of Balochistan. And Taliban turns violent on security in Afghanistan after peace deal breakup. In a major development, the Financial Action Task Force in its plenary meeting this week decided in principle that Pakistan will remain on its grey list till February 2020 and directed the country to take extra measures for the complete elimination of terror financing and money laundering, a report. The Financial Action Task Force meeting in Paris this week reviewed the measures that Islamabad has taken to control money laundering and terror financing. The review meeting concluded with Islamabad continuing its stay in grey list till February 2020 for failing in putting substantial curbs on terror financing and money laundering. The meeting of the International Watchdog observed that Islamabad will have to take further steps on restricting terror financing and money laundering in these four months. Continuing its stay in grey list will have severe impact on Pakistan's economy, which is already surviving on hefty loans from world monetary organizations and other developed countries. The Financial Action Task Force, which gets together for its plenary meeting, and this time in France, it has put Pakistan back and still remain on the grey list. The effect of that is that Pakistan can still get financing from IMF, World Bank, International, access its accounts, except for those who have been named terrorists, like accounts of Hafiz Saeed, uh, Jashim Muhammad, and other accounts. So at the present moment, Pakistan, in the grey list, and not in the dark grey or black list, still has got access to international funds, international accounts, except for individuals. It was in the grey list and it is still remain after another meeting in the grey list. In the plenary session of FATF, Pakistan was able to address only 5 out of 27 targets. The members of FATF expressed serious concerns with the overall lack of progress in addressing its transnational risk. The FATF decided by consensus that Pakistan would be retained on grey list and was given a stern warning which read, strongly urge Pakistan to swiftly complete its full action plan by February 2020, otherwise should significant and sustainable progress not be made across the full range of its action plan by next plenary, the FATF will take action, including urging members to advise the financial institutions to give special attention to business relations or transactions with Pakistan. FATF's president, Xiang Min Liu, who hails from China, also slammed Pakistan and wanted of getting blacklisted in the next meeting if the country fails to put curbs on terror financing. Pakistan agreed to an action plan to fix serious weaknesses in its anti-money laundering and terrorist financing framework. Despite a high-level commitment from Pakistan to fix these weaknesses, Pakistan has not made enough progress. Pakistan's action plan deadlines have now expired. While Pakistan has made some tangible progress under its new government, which the FATF welcomes, the majority of the issues under the action plan still remain outstanding, including effective measures to prevent terrorist financing. The moment a nation gets put in the blacklist, it invites immediate economic sanctions and punishment. 
Borrowing will become difficult, non-banking financial institutions will come under financial scrutiny and bailouts and IMF packages will also become harder to access. In such scenario, it becomes imperative for Pakistan to regulate its economy and finances to avoid getting blacklisted in FATF in February 2020. The last two meetings of the FATF had in Colorado and this final meeting, which was in Paris, was to decide of the 27 conditions given to Pakistan to follow if it does not want to go into the blacklist. They have only followed five or 22 could not be followed fully. So they have warned Pakistan that in February 2020, if you do not follow all the conditions that you have put, they have put Hafiz Saeed into jail, they have banned Jash e Mohammed, uh, they have changed to Jamaatudullah uh, names, they have changed. So Financial Action Taxation Force is a United Nations body with powers to put financial curbs on countries who are laundering or doing wrong use of money, even drug money or whatever method of wrong money laundering. Experts suggested FATF in effect has given notice to global financial institutions that they need to prepare for the imminent red flagging of the jurisdiction and ready the system for eventuality of Pakistan entering the FATF blacklist in February 2020. The Financial Action Task Force is a global anti-money laundering watchdog that also turned its scanner to money laundering as a means to finance terror activities across the world. It places nations in three categories, whitelist, greylist and the blacklist. Eight months after Indian Air Force bombed the Jesh e Muhammad terrorist camp in Pakistan's Balakot, Indian intelligence agencies have received inputs that 45 to 50 hardcore terrorists, including suicide bombers, are being trained there. The development has come days after Indian Northern Command Chief Lieutenant General Ranbir Singh claimed that nearly 500 terrorists were waiting to cross over the LOC. He also said 200 to 300 terrorists are operating in hinterland of Jammu and Kashmir to keep the region in turmoil with Pakistan support. A report. Pakistan-sponsored terrorists are receiving all kinds of aids from Islamabad to facilitate their mission of a bleeding India with thousand cuts. Intelligence reports suggest 45 to 50 terrorists, including suicide bombers, are undergoing repressive training at Jaish e Mohammed camp in Balakot. Also, some 500 terrorists are waiting at training camps along the line of control in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir ready to sneak into Jammu and Kashmir, a top Indian Army officer said this week. Takriban 200-300 terrorists in our area who have been coming and who have been coming with the attack. And in this way, in Pakistan, the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, the terrorist camp and launch pads, in that area, there are Takriban 500 people in every area of training and are ready for the Gospate. लेकिन ये जो फिगर्स हैं, ये एक अप्रॉक्सिमेट फिगर्स हैं, इसके अंदर बदलाव आता रहता है, जिस प्रकार से लोगों की और ट्रेनिंग होती रहती है। Indian Air Force's Mirage 2000 fighter jets had decimated a Jesh e Mohammed terror camp in Balakot on February 26 this year. The Jesh e Mohammed terror camp destroyed in the air strikes carried out by Indian Air Force is located in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa of Pakistan. The terror camp located on a hilltop amidst thick forest was an advanced training center where suicide bombers were trained. Sources have revealed that the terror camps have been reactivated in Balakot and terrorists are undergoing extensive training to carry out attacks in India. I am in total agreement by the, with the statement made by the Army Commander Nathan Army. It's a fact that there are about 200 to 300 terrorists which are operating in the valley at this point of time. This notwithstanding, the security forces have been very successful in ensuring that no incident whatsoever has taken place in Kashmir on the last 70 odd days, which is a huge success story for us. As far as across the border is concerned, the anti-terrorism grid has been secured in a very significant manner, despite mega attempts by China to, by Pakistan, to push in terrorists. They failed to do so, and every time they've been able to push in terrorists, we managed to eliminate them at the border itself. So he's assured the nation 
that notwithstanding huge efforts by Pakistan, India is in very safe hands. The terrorists operating along the LOC under the shelter of Pakistan Army remain on a consistent lookout for chances of cross-border infiltration that is facilitated by ceasefire violations by Pakistani troops. Recently, infiltrated terrorists launched a grenade attack in Kashmir's main city of Srinagar. This is the second such attack within a span of a week and the third incident of its kind in Kashmir Valley since the state's temporary special status was revoked by Indian Union government. It's, it seems there is it's a grenade throwing inc incident, now we are investigating and uh, nobody is uh, seriously injured. Yeah. How many, what's the number that have been got injured in this attack? Six to seven, uh, yeah. We, any we'll have any cop injury or something? Or no, nothing, civilian? nothing, nothing. Only civilian. Launching immediate counter-terrorism action following the incidents of grenade attacks and killing of civilians in Kashmir, the Indian Army neutralized three terrorists in Anantanag this week. Terror activities from Pakistan are on a surge since August 5th. India's hostile neighbour is desperate to unleash bloodbath in hinterland of India and Jammu and Kashmir, for which it is also using drones along the Indian borders to facilitate intrusion. Recently, a Pakistan drone was spotted in Punjab's Firozpur district. The incidents of uh, drones from Pakistan dropping weapons on our side of the border is actually an indication of the frustration of Pakistan to be able to provide the support in terms of weapons to the terrorists operating inside our country. I wish to assure you all that all efforts are being made to ensure that these designs of Pakistan are not allowed to succeed. A lot of these have already been captured and we will ensure that such designs of Pakistan are absolutely curbed by our border guarding forces, whether they are on the line of control or on the international border. Pakistan is adopting a multi-pronged strategy to hamper peace in Kashmir. While it is already operating big terror factories in POK, on the other side, it is deploying arms to terrorists through drones to carry out large-scale terror attacks in India. Pakistan's southwestern province of Balochistan has remained one of the epicenters of violent terror activities. Pakistan's military and ISI has reared terrorists in Balochistan who have attacked civilians and activists taking part in any protest against Pakistan administration since seven decades. But the scenario has changed a bit in the last one decade. The terrorists are not only attacking Baloch nationalists, but the security forces in Balochistan. Recently, a policeman was killed in a terror attack on a police vehicle in Quetta city of Balochistan. We have a report. A policeman was killed and 10 others were injured in an explosion at Quetta's double road area in Balochistan. The improvised explosive device fitted in the motorcycle ripped off when a police vehicle passed a motorcycle parked alongside the road. The policeman identified as Khalil Ahmad died on the spot and five other policemen along with wounded civilians were rushed to the civil hospital Quetta. Jo mara sniper tha wo hit hua aur wo hi shahid hua. Baaki jo phir ek gaadi ko aag lagi aur teen char gaadiyon ko nuksan pahuncha hai. Balochistan civilians have remained constant targets of terrorists backed by Pakistan military and ISI. The frustrated Baloch separatists who have been struggling for an independent state since 1948 are often muzzled or shot down at the slightest protest against the administration. Baloch are struggling from the beginning. This situation for now it is really uh, intensifying because of this. And some people, they have, of course, uh, this insurgency started. And now this is like uh, one decade people are being killed in kidnapped and dumped and uh, various ways intimidated and that's the reason the situation is because of this uh, the people of you know, uh, Pakistani army is using it is proxy religious uh, um, you know fundamentalist against the uh, Baloch intellectual Baloch uh, students Baloch people because they want to put this uh, across this message across Baloch people that you are against the, the Muslim nation, country, 
which is uh, created on the name of the, in the name of Islam. So uh, the picture is that if you speak anything about Pakistan, it means you are against Islam or you are some kind of uh, uh, against the you know other people, Muslim people or something like that. So the situation is very bad, and they are kidnapping people and they are killing and dumping every day. The chaos and misery in the region has escalated further ever since the terrorists started attacking civilians and the security personnel both. It is a dire situation in Baluchistan where civilians and now the security forces have become the targets of terrorists who were earlier raised and sponsored by the Pakistan administration and the ISI. A slew of violent attacks against the U.S. troops, Afghan security forces and civilians is being witnessed all across Afghanistan. The terror outfit of Taliban has been targeting security forces ever since the U.S. took a U-turn on peace deal with Taliban. A relatively successful conclusion of the presidential elections last month too has baffled the terror outfit that has been blatantly claiming responsibility of suicide attacks and bomb blasts in Afghanistan on almost a daily basis. We have a report. A Taliban suicide bomber killed at least three policemen and wounded 27 when he set off explosive in a truck near a police headquarters in Afghanistan. The suicide bomb attack injured more than 20 children who were reading Quran in a madrasa near blast site in Lankmant province of Afghanistan. Taliban spokesperson Zabibullah Mujahid confirmed in a statement that the militants had used a large truck packed with explosive in the attack in the eastern province of Lakhman in Afghanistan. In another bomb blast in Shah Wali Kot district in Kandahar province, two civilians lost lives and several others were injured. Afghanistan has witnessed a surge in attacks by the Taliban who denounced the vote as a sham during presidential elections last month. United Nations has claimed that more than 85 civilians have been killed in election-related Taliban violence alone. Taliban terror group has been on an attacking spree against U.S. troops and Afghan forces after U.S. President Donald Trump called off the peace talks with the Taliban a few weeks before Afghans went for presidential polls. Jeetered after U.S. broke peace agreement, Taliban approached Pakistan for peddling peace talks further. But the peace deal with the U.S. seems improbable as Taliban terrorists have resorted to unpaid attacks on U.S. troops, which was the key reason behind U.S. taking a U-turn on any peace agreement with Taliban. On the other hand, Pakistan has already been circled by the U.S. and international community as a global terror-sponsoring nation. In the current scenario, Taliban could least expect Pakistan to be their envoy for peace deal. Terrorism is emerging as a growing menace in South Asia. FATF's decision of putting Pakistan in grey list is a result of a reckless terror financing in the subcontinent that has its roots in Islamabad. The region between Afghanistan and Pakistan borders has become a hub of terror activities and the government seemed to have no control on them. To speak more on this issue, we are now joined by Mr. Matthew Garrod, an analyst on global terrorism issues. Mr. Garrett, do you believe terror financing has emerged as a global threat in the contemporary world? I, be, I believe it is a, a global threat, that's right. Uh, for many years it's been overlooked and uh, underappreciated by the international community. And I think the Security Council and the UN have started to really wake up to this threat since around about 2014, 2015. And uh, I think in particular this, this, this nexus between crime and terrorist financing, I think it's a big problem in, in South Asia and it's a growing problem. And we see that in particular uh, uh, across the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, especially in trade in narcotics, 
uh, trade in auto, uh, auto vehicles, um, in, in weaponry. Um, so it's a, it's a growing threat, for sure. According to you, what necessary steps should be taken to deal with the various terrorist outfits? which are based in Pakistan and in parts of Afghanistan. In particular, from, from my experience, there's a, a, lo a lot of issues here around the, the tribal areas, the tribal regions on the Afghan-Pakistan border. And uh, th there's really a lack of governance. We're seeing elements of corruption as well. So public officials overlooking certain groups who are, who are just residing in those territories. And a really a lack of law enforcement uh, and cooperation with other states who are affected by this. Many Western countries have asked Pakistan to act against UN-designated terrorists. Even FATF has once again put the country into the grey list. How do you think Pakistan will react in such kind of situation? I can't see any solution to this uh, short term. This is going to have to be a long term solution. Even with the FAT, FATF's uh, recommendations and listings, I can't see the Pakistan government moving much on this because it just doesn't have the capacity to control the territories where a lot of these groups are, are residing and operating from. It doesn't have the ability to do it. And the border with Afghanistan just makes it almost impossible because people traverse the border. And Afghanistan doesn't have the capacity either to deal with this. So I can't see any solution. Do you see a possible nexus between the state, the Pakistan army, and the jihadist outfit that is preventing the state from taking relevant actions against terror group? I think it's probably true to say that some of, the, some of the groups and some of the individuals have close alliances and links with people in Pakistan and they're part of Pakistan and they may have close relations as well and there definitely is a, we see a pattern of these people being overlooked uh, and a lack of law enforcement. So maybe there is some connection there between the, the army in Pakistan, I'm not sure about that but th there could be some links there but it, it might explain why there's been a lack of activity. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.